Welcome to the World War I Centennial News Podcast. It's about then, what was happening a hundred years ago in the aftermath of World War I. And it's about now, how a world transformed by World War I is very present in our lives today. But perhaps equally important, the podcast is about why and how we will never let those events fall back into the mists of obscurity. So welcome to World War I Centennial News. Episode number 111. This week on the show, we're opening with a walk through the headlines of the New York Times from 100 years ago. Mike Schuster reports on a humanitarian crisis spreading across Europe and the Middle East and what it means to America. Then, Dr. Edward Lengel offers a wonderful first-person account of a Y girl, a YMCA volunteer, as she works to comfort the soldiers in war-torn France. Steve Mall from the Pangolin Foundry in the UK gives us some insight into what it takes to create a large bronze sculpture, like the one that we're planning for the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C., and to honor their coming home to New York 100 years ago this week, we're going to have a musical treat from the 369th Experience, the regimental tribute band made up of college students from around the country. Dr. Carissa Threat tells us about the story of 18 African-American nurses who joined the Army Nurse Corps. And much more, all this week on World War I Centennial News, which is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, the Star Foundation, the General Motors Foundation, and Walmart. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission and your host. Welcome to the show. One hundred years ago this week, the headlines of the New York Times are boldly announcing assassinations, strikes about the unavailability of beer, Bolshevik and communist threats all over. Wilson almost doesn't make it home, but once home promotes the League of Nations everywhere and always more stories about beer. With that as a setup, let's jump into our centennial time machine and go back 100 years to the last week of February of 1919. Dateline, Saturday, February 22nd, 1919. Headline, Civil War Breaks Out in Munich. Premier Eisner slain. Minister Auer wounded. Clemenceau feeling better. Bolshevist center found in Paris. And the story about Eisner's assassination includes... Herr Eisner, with Herr Merkel, his secretary, were walking along the Pranerstrasse to attend the opening of the Landstag, where he intended to deliver an important speech. Suddenly, Lieutenant Count Arco Valley, formerly an officer in the Prussian Guard, shouting, Down with the revolution! Long live the Kaiser! fired at Herr Eisner from behind at a distance of a few yards. Two bullets penetrated the Premier's head and he fell dead on the pavement. The first news of the tragedy reached the Landstag when a Bavarian soldier, holding Herr Eisner's blood-covered spectacles in his hand, entered shouting, Eisner has been murdered. A government spokesman stated, Nothing shows the breakdown of order more clearly than when murder becomes a political weapon. If the sacrificial death of Herr Eisner has good results, they will be in bringing us all together to do away with evil conditions. It would mean the ruin of Germany if all did not take this view and join in the condemnation of this act. And on the same day, back in the U.S., Headline, 181,000 Union men vote to strike if beer is outlawed. Referendum of seven unions against prohibition reported to central body here. And on the next day. Dateline, Sunday, February 23, 1919. 
Headline, Soviet Republic Proclaimed in Bavarian Outbreak, State of Siege in Munich. Reds Seek to Avenge Eisner. Communist Revolution is Started in Budapest. Well, on Monday. Dateline, Monday, February 24th, 1919. Headline, President's Ship Narrowly Misses Running Aground in Fog, Anchors Safely in Boston Harbor. Wilson Will Speak Today. Also on the same day. Headline, 14 members of the industrial workers of the world arrested here for plot against president. Bomb planned for Wilson. Reported that it was to have been thrown as he spoke in Boston. The next day, the headline is filled with Wilson's words. Dateline, Tuesday, February 25th, 1919. Headline, Wilson brings home the world's message of reliance on America. Asks, shall we disappoint that hope? Wilson speaks in Boston. The next day. Dateline, Wednesday, February 26th, 1919. Headline, no extra session until Wilson again returns from Paris. Will be at Capitol after today to confer with members. Summons governors and mayors to speak to them there. Dateline, Thursday, February 27th, 1919. Headline, President expounds League of Nations to dinner guests, urges that present draft not be radically amended. Sovereignty may be diminished, he says, for the world's good. However, any nation may withdraw, not bound to stay in the League against its will, the President says. And wrapping up this in incredibly tumultuous week, we're going to close with another headline about those who actually want to secede from the Union because of beer and wine. Headline, calls for secession move to allow beer and wine. To permit this would be defying the Constitution, says leader of Dries at Albany. Threat of federal jailing. Anderson announces new political fight if enforcement measure fails. And those are the headlines that were rolling across the front page of the New York Times a hundred years ago this week in a world trying to adjust to the aftermath of the war that changed everything. It's time for Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and curator for the Great War Project blog. Okay, Mike, so they stop shooting in the trenches and empires fall. But your post this week points out that the world may be in more danger right now than ever. And this time, those who are going to suffer are the citizens of the disrupted nations, both the enemies and the allies alike, in danger of a devastating world famine and potential total chaos. Did this catch everybody by surprise? It seems to have, Teo. Our headline reads, Famine Spreads in Europe. Millions go without. Who can solve the growing disaster? It falls to the United States. And this is special to the Great War Project. The powers at the peace conference soon realize they have taken responsibility for vast areas of Europe and indeed much of the world. Writes historian Margaret McMillan, it is a role they have failed to anticipate. The peacemakers soon discovered that they had taken on the administration of much of Europe and large parts of the Middle East. Old ruling structures had collapsed, she writes, and allied occupation forces and allied representatives were being drawn in to take their place. There was little choice. If they did not do it, no one would. Or worse, revolutionaries might. One example in Belgrade, a British admiral scraped together a small fleet of barges and sent them up and down the Danube River, carrying food and raw materials. This brought about a meager revival in trade and industry, but it was a stopgap measure. The war, Macmillan reports, had disrupted the world's economy and it would not be easy to get it going again. The war had left factories unusable, fields untilled, bridges and railway lines destroyed. There were shortages of fertilizer, seeds, raw materials, shipping, locomotives. Europe still depended largely on coal for its fuel. But the mines in France, Belgium, Poland, and Germany were flooded. 
from all quarters of Europe, historian Macmillan reports, came alarming reports of millions of unemployed men, desperate housewives feeding their families on potatoes and cabbage soup, emaciated children. In the first cold winter of the peace, Herbert Hoover, then the American Relief Administrator, warns the Allies that some 200 million people in the enemy countries, and almost as many again in the victors and the neutral nations, they all faced famine. Germany alone needed 200,000 tons of wheat per month and 70,000 tons of meat. In the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, hospitals have run out of bandages and medicine. In what became the new state of Czechoslovakia, a million children are going without milk. In Vienna, more babies are dying than were surviving. People were eating coal dust, food shavings, and sand. The humanitarian case for doing something was unanswerable. So was the political one. So long as hunger continued to gnaw, warned President Wilson, the foundations of government would continue to crumble. Surplus food is available. So are the ships to transport it. But where is the money? The European allies could not finance relief on the scale that was needed. Germany had gold reserves, but the victorious allies, France in particular, block Germany's use of its gold for any purpose other than war reparations. That leaves the United States. But Congress and the American people are ambivalent about embarking on such an enormous task. President Wilson reluctantly agrees, but only if he can put Herbert Hoover in charge. Hoover has made a reputation for himself as a leader in distributing humanitarian aid, despite the charge by some European leaders that Hoover would become dictator of Europe. But to Wilson and many Americans, Hoover is a hero. During the war, he had organized a massive relief operation in German-occupied Belgium. For President Wilson, it's Herbert Hoover, or no one. And that's the news these days, a century ago, from the Great War Project. Mike Schuster is the curator for the Great War Project blog. The link to his post is in the podcast notes. Dr. Edward Lengel, whose blog is called A Storyteller Hiking Through History, is a regular contributor to the podcast. This week, Ed offers a first-hand account from a brave and really cool Y girl, one of the thousands of young American women who fearlessly shipped out for war-torn France to help. I find this an incredibly touching story of an admirable and really strong American woman and a very appropriate lead-in to March, Women's History Month. Catherine Shortall, a young woman serving with the YMCA, didn't leave the United States until the war was already over. In fact, one of the first things she saw as her ship departed New York City in December 1918 was another ship pulling in, filled with doughboys excited to be home. The soldiers climbed the rigging and catching sight of the outbound ship filled with young women in YMCA outfits cheered deliriously. But Shortall's real mission was to the men still over there. Her sympathetic and determined character ensured that she would have an impact. The YMCA women landed in Liverpool in early January and were immediately tasked with staffing a formal dance for the many servicemen of all nations who packed the city. Shortall added her skill as a guitar player to a quintet of musicians. From there, it was on to London, where she found the streets, quote, absolutely flooded with men in uniform, soldiers of all kinds. She and her friends studied the men closely. There were, she wrote home to her mother, many Australians and New Zealanders, tall, lean men with weather-beaten faces, and a certain attractive swagger, which is augmented by their broad-brimmed hats turned up at one side. She admired the British in their splendid uniforms with their unmistakable bearing, but thought, the most striking of all are the Scotch, perfect giants of men in their kilts and plaids, bare knees and all. But Shortall's heart rose at the many wounded men wearing the blue hospital uniform, with arms and legs gone, heads bandaged, limping forth to get the air. And most sadly, of everyone they met in the streets, no one ever smiled, she remembered. Faces were dull and joyless. Clothes were old, shoes were shapeless and soggy. Everyone seemed hopeless rather than actively sorrowful. Catherine Shortall was a good listener. For many soldiers just returning from battle, that was just what they needed. On a train bound for Paris, she stopped to talk with a doughboy from Ohio who had seen action fighting alongside the British in Flanders. As he described the battle line, his face was drawn with the horror of it, she later wrote. Yet he had to talk about it, and I let him hoping he would get it off his chest that way. 
When he finished, the soldier grasped her hand in gratitude. You're the first honest-to-goodness American girl I've talked to for 15 months, he said, and I sure won't forget you. In Paris, in the Place de la Concorde, Shirdal was both fascinated and horrified to see the vast array of captured guns that had been put on display there. There were trench mortars, ugly, chunky guns, particularly vicious-looking, she said, and field artillery lined hub to hub, all camouflaged, mottled, and streaked in green and brown. It is bewildering to look at them, Shirdal wrote. They are a symbol, I suppose, of a great indelible mark in the book of history. But now, one little mortal standing in the presence of those recently silenced mouths can only shiver and go away. It is too soon. Catherine Shirdal was stationed in the tiny little French village of Poulinet in eastern France, where troops of the U.S. 78th Division were stationed. There, she and her fellow YMCA women set to work setting up a recreation tent where they distributed reading materials, coffee, hot chocolate, cigarettes, and donuts. A talented musician, Shirdal also played ragtime piano, but she found that the main thing the doughboys there wanted was just to talk, laugh, joke, and flirt in the company of young women, just what they needed to help them forget the war and return to some idea of normalcy. Shirdal convened a big celebration and concert for Valentine's Day 1919. The movie projector she planned to use broke down, but no one cared. In this pre-USO era, the Doughboys were delighted for any form of entertainment, and Shirdal was happy to sing and dance for them. There was I alone among all these great rough men, she wrote, yet I don't know why I should call them rough. More sweet consideration was never shown to anyone than was shown me that evening. She nearly broke down with emotion when a young soldier who had been gassed and lost his voice performed a beautiful violin solo. And so Shirdal and the YMCA women helped the days pass a little faster until the 78th Division was called home in the spring of 1919. A wave of loneliness passed through her as she visited Poulinet for the last time, only to find it empty of men. Its soul departed. Sent back to Paris, she encountered a detachment of African-American soldiers stationed with a labor battalion outside the city. Discovering that they loved music, but that their one guitar was broken, Shirdal repaired the strings for them, and then stayed to join them in an impromptu jazz ensemble that entertained troops in the area over the following several days. With the YMCA disbanding its operations that summer, Shirdal resigned her position, but she refused to go home. Joining the French Red Cross's Union of the Women of France, she changed the insignia on her uniform and departed to work in the war-ravaged villages along the old front lines, doing her small part to contribute to healing war's terrible wound. Dr. Edward Lengel, historian, World War I expert, author, and storyteller hiking through history. We have links to Ed's post and his author's website in the podcast notes. Okay, it's time to fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. As our regular listeners know, This part of the podcast focuses on the present and explores the ongoing World War I documentation and commemoration, education and exploration. Here is where we try to show you how the echoes of the war that changed the world are still very present in our everyday lives. Welcome to A Hundred Years in the Making, about the National World War I Memorial that we're building in Washington, D.C., This ongoing series of reports and interviews provides our listeners with a rare insider view into the intricate and complex process of creating a national memorial. As many of you know, a centerpiece element of the memorial is a giant bronze sculpture called A Soldier's Journey by sculptor Howard Sabin, who's been on the show several times talking about his own journey in creating it. There's another aspect in creating a giant bronze sculpture, especially those very rare works of this size. At some point, the artist's vision needs to become manifest in metal. And of course, you don't take out a giant block of bronze and a chisel and a hammer and sculpt away. A bronze sculpture is cast from molten metal in a mold. You can start to imagine the scale, scope, and challenges of doing that for something that's 7 feet tall and 60 feet wide. This kind of work is done in a foundry 
and there are very few in the world that are able to take on a sculpture the size of the World War I memorial sculpture. With us today is Steve Mall, the director of one of the most esteemed and advanced foundries in the world, located just north of Bristol in the United Kingdom. It's called Pangolin Editions. Steve, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Teo. Great to be here with you guys. So, Steve, tell us a little bit about Pangolin Editions. What kind of work does the company do? And maybe you can describe the physical plant a bit as well and the history. Well, primarily, we're a foundry that works solely on artwork. Most people imagine a foundry as being heavy industry, casting the pieces of engineering. We only focus upon art. We're by far the largest foundry in the UK. We started a little over 35 years ago, very humbly in the back garden of our founder's greenhouse, in the back garden of their parents' home. We have now grown to be a little under 200,000 square feet, and we have a team of 180 craftsmen and women. So we've grown to meet the needs of a burdening art world, and one where they continue to find bronze and enduring material. An artist like Sabin needs to translate his vision, a very nuanced vision, something that he lovingly shapes and renders with his mind, his eyes, and his hands, into this gigantic gigantic process that involves moving tons of metal, molten, dozens of processes and people. Can you help our listeners understand just how that happens? One thing that is an important definition to make between ourselves and Sabin, the artist, is we do not consider ourselves the artist. We are artisans that work upon his work. So if you will, we're a team of technicians and we follow processes. Sabin will make the artwork his own, be created, as you say, by his own hand. What we will do is we will simply follow processes to achieve that vision as accurately as possible in a given time to give Sabin back what he requires in a more permanent material. A big part of what a foundry does involves craft and science that began centuries ago. But today, as you mentioned, there's some technology that's becoming part of the process. Can you give us some insight into that? One of the things that we've been able to do with Sabin's project with the memorial is to use a process called photogrammetry. We developed that in conjunction with another company that we work very closely with, a photography studio called Steve Russell Studios. We have essentially built what we call a photogrammetry rig. And if you can imagine what it is, is a large 15 feet diameter turntable with a rig built upon that that houses 160 very high resolution cameras. We take a model, a real person, we put them into a uniform or a nurse's outfit, however Sabin wants supposed to be. And we shoot all of those cameras simultaneously. And what those images do, we have special software which we've developed, which allows us to stitch all those images together to create a three-dimensional file, which we can then put into a physical form. And we use that as a very accurate armature for Sabin to then model upon. I also want to mention just for our audience, you know, Sabin started the process of design by using an iPhone camera and shooting pictures of models and starting his sketching from that. So this is sort of the three-dimensional digital version of that amped up a lot. It is. We talk about it being an armature because for us, something that's produced by machine can never really replace the artist. What we will create and be able to give Sabin for him to start on is actually a very accurate model, what he's shown from the actual physical model that he's chosen that we've put inside the camera rig. The reason we do that is obviously that these figures will be slightly over life size. And for Sabin to do it the traditional way with a steel armature starting and an enormous bag of clay, it would be half of a lifetime's work to create all the figures required. So what we're doing is we're using technology to give him a head start. What material is the armature made out of? The armature will be machined on a large five-axis CNC machine in a polyurethane foam, a high-density foam. Then you send that to his studio and he starts to put clay on it? We send that to Sabin's studio. He puts clay on it. He creates the artwork. And then from then we go back into the traditional mold processes of foundry casting, which is to start by making a rubber mold. Walk us through the process a little bit of then what happens. Once Sabin has finished the artwork and he is happy with it, essentially we take that original positive that Sabin's created and we create a soft rubber negative of that original artwork. We then take that negative and we paint wax into that negative. That wax is liquid, it's hot, we paint it into the mold. As the wax cools, we're able to remove the wax from the mold and the wax then, if you like, is a hollow copy of the original artwork that Sabin has created. We then take that hollow wax, we cut it into pieces because we can't cast the whole thing together. It needs to be broken into pieces. 
we surround those waxes in a refractory material. In this case, it will most likely be plaster or ceramic, depending on the process we choose. That whole thing then sits inside a kiln or a large oven. The oven melts the wax out, which then leaves a space behind it. And that space, again, is a negative of the original artwork. And into that space, we pour molten metal, therefore giving us the hard, positive copy in bronze of the original artwork, which is the memorial. So there's a lot of engineering involved in actually breaking the sculpture apart and reassembling it, isn't there? There's a huge amount of engineering. We will be consulting with structural engineers to make sure that it's strong enough. We'll be consulting, obviously, with the rest of the team building the memorial park in terms of foundation, fixings, cranes, everything else that goes with a major civil project like this. I'm just trying to imagine how much metal is poured into something like that. Is there any kind of a sense of that? Yes, at this stage, about 15 metric tons, about 32,000 pounds. That's quite a lot of bronze. (laughs) That's great. This is a big story and a big sculpture. How often is something this large made? Well, we are a significantly large foundry. We make artworks all the time. Usually we make artworks that are for private collectors or galleries. Not often do we make a memorial of the stature that this piece will be. We often make more contemporary work as well. And I think to occasionally have something with such classicism as this piece has is a real thrill for us. It is going to be a stunning piece. And people have seen, you know, the 10-foot maquette. Clearly, this story is huge, as is the sculpture, and maybe we can have you come back later as the process continues, would you? I'd be absolutely delighted. Thank you, Taya. Steve Maul is the director of Pangolin Editions, a premier foundry located in the UK and working with sculptor Saban Howard on The Soldier's Journey for the National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. Learn more from the links in the podcast notes. Last week, Jason Moran, the Artistic Director for Jazz at the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, talked to us about James Reese Europe, the famous band leader of the Harlem Hellfighters 369th Regimental Band. As a part of the Centennial Commemoration, and with the help of the Coca-Cola Foundation and the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the 369th Experience was created, a tribute band of students from universities and colleges around the country. And for November 11th, 2018, on the centennial of the armistice, the band was brought to Washington, D.C. and performed at the site of the future National World War I Memorial there. James Reese Europe III, grandson of the band leader, and Noble Cecil Jr., grandson of Noble Cecil, who was mentored by Europe, introduced the band and their music. My name is James Reese Europe III, and I am very proud and very happy to be here, and I'm happy that all of you are here as well. I'm Noble Cecil Jr., and he's the grandson of my father's mentor, James Reese Europe. They started out in 1913 as the New York National Guard, the 15th, and they used to march around the streets of Harlem with just broomsticks over their shoulders because they had no weapons then. But eventually, they were taken into the Army, and they were sent over to France, and they were redesignated the 369th. Now, the 369th was known by many names. They were known themselves as the Harlem Rattlers because of the rattlesnake on their flag. The French called them the Men of Bronze. Their German enemy referred them as Fighting Men from Hell, and that gave them their most popular nickname, the Hellfighters. And as their commanding officer said, they had the best damn band in the army. But they weren't just a band, they were a combat unit, and they compiled an amazing combat accomplishment. They went 191 consecutive days at the front. That's the most of any American regiment in the war. They won 171 individual awards, as well as a regimental corps de guerre, the highest award that the French will give. Though they were less than 1% of the armed forces, at one point they held 20% of the front. The 369th were the first soldiers to touch the Rhine River as the Germans retreated back into Germany. Our musicians are made up of students from 12 colleges and universities in nine states. They answered the call on the internet, sent in their videos for their auditions. They were selected and then they waited until this moment. It's New Year's Day, 1918. 
and the 369th come ashore in France for the very first time, and the very first piece they played, the French national anthem, the Marseillaise. They played it with such a jazzed up, driven, syncopated melody that it took eight or 10 bars for the French to realize that they were playing their own national anthem. That was the beginning of France's love affair with jazz. Now, the 369th, they played concerts all over France. Many of them were outdoor concerts. At one such concert, my grandfather finished the piece he was working on. He looked behind him, he saw a little boy, no more at 10, a little French boy. And he was mimicking my grandfather and flailing his arms back and forth. Turned around, he called that little boy up to the stage, handed the little boy his baton. My grandfather stepped back, kind of quietly started the band going. And that little boy just took off a big beaming smile across his face and he just had the time of his life. Memphis Blues was one of the most famous songs made popular in Europe by Jim Europe and the 369. That was the most requested song. <laughs> The next song is a 1918 song, and I know some of you who were probably born, I don't know, in the 40s, this is our rendition of Jada. <laughs> Now we have a more contemporary piece for you. This piece was written by our very own Kelvin Washington, the Associate Director of Music and Bands at Howard University. The 369th strut. We're going to close out the show with a medley of songs that represent all the branches of service. We have a special conductor. He's the chief warrant officer for U.S. Army, retired, but he's also the associate director of the Washington Redskins marching band. Ed Green, and he's going to wake you up if you've fallen asleep already. <laughs> 
selected clips from the Armistice Centennial performance by the 369th Experience, a 369th Regimental Tribute Band made possible by the hard work of a lot of people, including the tireless Stephanie Neal, band director Dr. Israel Butler, over 30 students from historically black colleges and universities, a whole bunch of friends, a grant from the Coca-Cola Foundation, and the support of the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. We have links for you in the podcast notes, including a full-length video of the performance. This week in our segment, The Historian's Corner, we're going to talk about a subject that bridges our February's Black History Month theme with March's Women's History Month. We're going to talk about 18 African-American nurses that joined the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. To tell us about this, we're joined by Dr. Carissa Threat, Associate Professor of History at Chapman University. Dr. Threat is part of a growing group of scholars that are broadening the view of military history to include scholarship that explores the intersection of civil-military relationships that relate to race, gender, and conflict. Dr. Threat, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Taylor. I was going to mention that you're an associate of Dr. Jennifer Keene, who was on the show with us a couple of weeks ago, aren't you? I am, brand new. Oh, well, it sounds like the subject of World War I, African-American participation and women's participation is seriously alive and well at Chapman. Yes, definitely. Okay, so Carissa, I'm fascinated by the story for a whole bunch of reasons. Let me start with gender. Did the Army actually recognize these women as members of the Army? Well, the easy answer to that is yes and no, because technically the Army Nurse Corps was an auxiliary of the Army, meaning the nurses who served in the Army Nurse Corps served with the military, but not in the military technically. So while they were recognized as being part of the military, they had a very ambiguous relationship in terms of benefits and in terms of status. Yeah. Did they earn veterans benefits? Most of them did not. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Army Nurse Corps reduced its size considerably after World War I. And so a lot of nurses, even if they did want to stay in the military, were essentially out after the end of the war by the time we get to 1919. So there was very few benefits attached to that. Nothing like what we see later on in World War II with the GI Bill, for example. Well, now, the women that we're going to be talking about, the African-American women that served as nurses, they started serving post-armistice, didn't they? Yes. For many months before the end of the war, from the summer, actually, of 1918, the Army had kind of grappled with accepting Black nurses. And there was an initial attempt to have at least 20 Black nurses enrolled in the Army Nurse Corps in July, but that ultimately failed. What actually ended up happening was the influenza outbreak of 1918 really did lead to these nurses finally being accepted. And what happens is the way that nurses are accepted into the Army Nurse Corps during World War I and during World War II is that they first enroll in the Red Cross Reserve. And it's from there that they move into the Army Nurse Corps. So once the influenza outbreak spread, and the reality is they needed more and more nurses to help with both those soldiers coming home, but the influenza that was spreading into the civilian population, this is when the Surgeon General accepted the first 18 Black nurses into the Army Nurse Corps officially in late November 1918. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that the battle that they were fighting killed more people than the war. So (laughs) it's a noble cause. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, this is one of the strange and interesting things about the story of these Black nurses is that although they were desperate and really pushed for their acceptance in the Army Nurse Corps during the war, it really took a major health epidemic to get them into the Army Nurse Corps so that they could serve their country officially because many of these women were actually serving in unofficial capacities with either the Red Cross or they were being hired as civilian nurses who were then working in military hospitals. There was a small group of Black student nurses 
from Tuskegee School of Nursing who ended up at Cap Sheridan, Illinois to help the influenza patients there during the early part of 1919. So, you know, you have that as well. There are many more nurses than just these 18 that were ultimately serving in military hospitals, but it's the 18 that we know were finally inducted into the Army Nurse Corps. Now, I understand that some accounts of these women only list nine nurses who served at Camp Sherman, Ohio. Tell us about the discovery of the others. Yeah, well, there's actually, and this is just a little quirk, there are actually two sets of nine nurses serving each at both Camp Sherman, Ohio, and Camp Grant in Illinois. So there were actually two groups of nurses who were officially inducted. We know more about the Captain Sherman nurses because there's a lot more written about them. And we have a couple of the nurses themselves who served at Camp Sherman who go on to write their own memoirs and who stay in nursing for many years. So they continuously tell their story. But there are another nine set of nurses who end up being at Camp Grant, Illinois, and their names are widely available if people look for them because their names were published in places like the American Journal of Nursing, Nursing World. All of these professional nursing magazines did list these nurses when they were inducted and where they went. But if you don't know where to look, it's hard to find them. Is there a book that's been written about all this? There are a couple earlier books. So Darlene Clark Hine is a historian, emeritus professor at this point, who wrote one of the first well-known books about Black nurses and the racial challenges they face in a book called Black Women in White, Racial Conflict and the Nursing Profession. And she talks extensively about Black nurses and their fight for professional recognition. And as part of that conversation, she does talk about these nurses who did serve in World War I. But there's not a one single large-scale book that's been written just about the Black nurses in World War I. They're usually included in other books like my own, as part of a larger story about racial conflict and civil rights activism. Well, what's the name of your book? So my book is titled Nursing Civil Rights, Race and Gender in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps. It focuses largely on World War II through Vietnam, but it does also talk about World War I, and it really highlights both the kind of racial conflict that was happening within the Army Nurse Corps, but also, interesting enough, white male nurses who were also barred from acceptance in the Army Nurse Corps really until the 1950s. So it highlights kind of both conversations about race, but also gender in the nursing profession and with the military. So from your point of view, what are the most important elements our listeners should take away from the story? For me, I think the listeners should understand that Black nurses were fully aware and wanting to participate in World War I that when calls came, they were available and they did step up to the plate. As one Black female nurse who served in World War I, Eileen Cole writes, she says, we had no opportunity for service above and beyond the call, but we also served with dignity when we could. Just kind of my paraphrase of what she wrote. Well, thank you. That's a great story. Thank you. Dr. Carissa Threat, Associate Professor of History at Chapman University, where she researches and teaches classes in U.S. and African American history, war, and society. To learn more, we have links for you in the podcast notes. Welcome to our segment called Speaking World War I, where we explore the words and phrases that are rooted in the war. For this week, first a little background. As America entered the war, Less than 15 years after the Wright brothers' first powered flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903, many prominent people, including the airplane pioneer Orville Wright, believed and campaigned strongly that airplane power and dominating the skies was the solution for ending the war in Europe. Orville Wright famously wrote, quote, when my brother and I built and flew the first man-carrying flying machines, we thought we introduced into the world an invention which would make further wars practically impossible. He continued with, If the Allied armies are equipped with such a number of airplanes as to keep the enemy planes entirely back of the line so that they're unable to direct gunfire or to observe the movement of allied troops. In other words, if the enemy's eyes can be put out, it will be possible to end the war. 
This is also taking into account what might be done by bombing German sources of munitions and supplies. He concludes with, To end the war quickly and cheaply, the supremacy in the air must be complete as to entirely blind the enemy. However, at the time, German air technology and capability was unquestionably superior. To counter this, the U.S. Congress passed a bill in July of 1917, just a few months after we declared war, called the Aviation Act of 1917. It allocated an incredible $640 million to build up America's aviation program. But you got to take it in context of the times. What is $640 million from 1917 worth in 2019 dollars? Well, it's almost $14 billion bucks. And at the time, it was the single largest government appropriation for a program in the country's history. Long story short, turns out that developing, designing, engineering, and building airplanes in volume uh, isn't so easy. And although the government subsidy was used to develop the foundation of what became the post-war U.S. aerospace industry, still dominant today, during the war, America never actually delivered any complete fighter planes. Now, we did deliver a great engine. It was called the Liberty Engine. And we did create an air force under the Army called the U.S. Army Air Service that by the armistice on November 11, 1918, had 170,000 men and 20,000 officers in it, and it trained hundreds of pilots. And they mostly flew British and French planes. At home, we built up a really big supply of airplanes that just never got deployed. Okay, so those hundreds of pilots we trained wanted to keep flying. Flying was a passion, and many of them joined as pilots for the newly developed airmail service from the U.S. Post Office, while others embraced this week's speaking World War I phrase. They started barnstorming. You see, you could buy a surplus airplane from the U.S. government for only $200. That's about the equivalent of $4,000 today, the price of a used car beater. Now, most Americans had only heard about airplanes, but had never seen one. And they flocked to see these daring young men in their flying machines whip through the skies and perform stunts, like flying through the open doors of a local barn. You know, barnstorming. Acrobats would often carry out feats of daring while standing on the wings of the airplanes. And as competition grew stiffer, pilots began to resort to more and more dangerous stunts to stand out. That led to a lot of accidents, and the government got concerned. So by 1926, the Congress passed the Air Commerce Act, which established the idea of basic air traffic rules and limited how low a pilot could fly during an exhibition. Now, these regulations pretty much marked an end to this week's speaking World War I word, barnstorming. But they also laid the foundation for the early airline industry and the Federal Aviation Administration. Barnstorming. Daring young men in their flying machines, thrilling rural America with war surplus planes, a hundred years ago in a world transformed by World War I. To learn more, we have a link for you in the podcast notes. This week in Articles and Posts, where we highlight the stories you'll find in our weekly newsletter, The Dispatch. Headline, Letters Home from African American Soldiers in World War I. During Black History Month, we've been bringing forward a number of little-known unique stories about the experience of African Americans in World War I. This includes a remarkable article created by Mr. Calvin Mitchell that gives a broad, insightful overview of the experience of those 360,000 African Americans who served based on their letters home. Headline, Peter Jackson's new feature film also carries World War I theme. On the heels of his enormously successful World War I documentary, They Shall Not Grow Old, Jackson continues to contemplate a world transformed by World War I, and in this case, his own world as well. The director has just released the first trailer of his upcoming J.R.R. Tolkien biographic feature film. The new movie explores how the horrors of World War I stimulated Tolkien to write what he called a fantastical adventure story about good and evil, destiny and prophecy, which we now know as the Lord of the Rings Trilogy. 
Headline, Coast Guard Sailor at Sea in World War I. A Coast Guardman's photos and letters home provide a from-the-deckplate view of patrol service in the Atlantic. In this article from Naval History Magazine by Commander Stephen Serko, U.S. Navy retired, you'll learn more about this first-person account of Frederick Richard Falks just four days after enlisting in the U.S. Coast Guard in 1917. Headline, Troop Ship Rescue from Fire Island. In the early morning of January 1st, 1919, surfman Roger Smith reported sighting the USS Northern Pacific a few miles southeast of Fire Island's Coast Guard Station No. 83. Unbeknownst to Smith, his initial report was the beginning of an 18-day saga that remains one of the most amazing yet often forgotten rescue stories of World War I. Dig into all these amazing stories through the links in our weekly dispatch newsletter. It's a short and easy guide to a lot of World War I news and information. A subscription to this wonderful weekly guide. It's free. You can subscribe at www.cc.org slash subscribe or follow the link in the podcast notes. And that wraps up episode number 111 of the award-winning World War I Centennial News Podcast. Thank you for listening. We also want to thank our great guests, our crew, and supporters, including Mike Schuster, curator for the Great War Project blog, Dr. Edward Langle, military historian and author, Steve Maury, director of Pangolin Editions in the UK, Dr. Carissa Threat, professor of history at Chapman University, James Reese Europe III, Noble Cecil Jr., and the 369th Experience Orchestra. Thanks to Mac Nelson and Tim Crow, our interview editing team, Katz Laszlo, the line producer for the show, J.L. Michaud and Dave Kramer for research and script support, and I'm Teo Mayer, your producer and host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I, including this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators, to their classrooms, and to the public. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's national World War I memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as our other sponsors, the Star Foundation, the General Motors Foundation, and the people of Walmart. The podcast and a full-length transcript of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org forward slash cn. You'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcasts, even using your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The podcast Twitter handle is at the WW1 Podcast. The Commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC, and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, keep the story alive for America by helping to build the memorial. Just text the letters WWI or WW1 to the phone number 91999. The Castle House Rag One Step was written by James Reese Europe. Thank you for listening. So long.